So welcome. Good morning, everyone that's here and everyone that's listening and watching online. Good morning to you as well. Uh, we are in Matthew 10. The section we're going to try to cover you is 17 through 42, which is a lengthy amount of verses. So I'm going to do my very best to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. And so will you all agree with me and pray for me in prayer? So Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus, who is the living word, who came from heaven down to earth so that we as human beings can see the fullness of your love, your heart your heart for us, your eternal plan to redeem earth back to your former glory of the garden of praise and the garden of Eden, the garden of paradise. So would you reveal love and paradise in our hearts and help us to understand the transition that you're bringing forth to make this happen. Would you be with me today, Holy Spirit? I surrender my mind and my heart to you. Would you help me to effectively, clearly, calmly, in a timely fashion, communicate your truths very gracefully and lovingly for all of us to understand? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want to start where we left off as a reminder. Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. Grace is unconditional, unmerited favor. It's who He is. Truth is the revelation of how everything's taking place in the natural realm to help us understand the spiritual realm. Um, as I shared before last week, where we're entering today, if you weren't here last week or listening online last week, um, these next verses could be kind of challenging to really understand God's heart through it all because they're tough. They're, it's what even the Apostle Paul said um, that, um, or Peter said about Apostle Paul that he wrote in all his letters that some things are harder to understand, that weak and unstable folks uh, have a hard time understanding it. Because it's hard when you see the truth of how life is going to play out to really see, unless you understand the Father's heart, his motive behind it all and why it had to happen this way. Um, I'm going to do my best to clearly communicate through Matthew 10, 17 through 42, his heart behind it all. And so you have to know, again, we shared this verse last week, but it, this verse that is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants how many people to be saved? All. He wants all, everybody to be saved. And to come to the knowledge, the epinosis, this is, this is greater than natural knowledge. The word knowledge is either gnosis in the Greek or epinosis. This is epi, it's epic, it's greater than natural knowledge. So Jesus came down to earth to give us a spiritual knowledge which is greater than just the natural knowledge. To help us understand the heavens and the gods and how it all works out and how he is supreme above it all and his love wins out in the end. So that's the absolute truth of it all. But you need to know the Father's heart before you understand how it's all going to play out. So remember the most common verse, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him, in Jesus, He is the way, the truth, and life. The only way to truly understand the, the, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the heart of God is through the Son. It can't be seen any other way. It can't even be seen reading this. It says that the Scriptures are void without out the life of Jesus. So He is the truth. He's the living Word that shows us what's written in here and reveals it all. So whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So God's heart is He wants nobody to perish and all to be saved. He did not come. It's important to understand God Almighty did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him, to save the earth, to save humanity, to save us all, to save everyone through Jesus. And that was the purpose why He came, is to destroy the works of the devil and all the condemnation, shame, guilt, and destruction that He's brought to the earth, to redeem it all. And it's ultimately to redeem the promise that He had in the beginning. And Paul wrote about this to Timothy. It's found in Timothy 1. I just want you to read this. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie, so God never lies, so God does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, in which now at the appointed season he's brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me and 
by the command of God our Savior. So it was brought to light through Jesus at that appointed season that the whole point of this, it was a promise in the beginning of time before God even created everything. He promised eternal life on the earth to humans that He created. And that was that promise got broken, not by God, but by Satan twisting it to bring death and destruction in. But God has an eternal plan of love to redeem us back to eternal life on the earth, heaven and earth together again, the spiritual realm and the natural realm together as he originally planned it and promised it. So that is what he's working on to fulfill. To fully understand that, um, let me go to this, is what I shared, is what he's just teaching us through the scriptures, and I want to highlight again, is he's all, it's all about sovereign love, which is perfect selflessness. That's the royal law, perfect selflessness. He's trying to redeem it. That's who he is. That's his identity, his selflessness. Everything he's just teaching us, like he said, brought to light. He uses this word picture of the trees, but it can be other word pictures of light and darkness. Wheat and tares, they're the, all the same teaching, the same principles, just with other word pictures. So you can look at this as darkness. You can look at this as light. And going back to this part, it says this is the verdict. A verdict is like in a court case when you've assessed all the facts and here is the outcome of what's going to happen. So God's telling us as sovereign judge and Lord, here's the verdict. Here's the outcome of what happened. Light, Jesus came into the world, but people loved what instead? darkness instead of the light. So he brought truth and love and what it really looks like to life, but the people loved darkness instead. And darkness is simply this. You can look at it as a tree. You can look at this as the tears, as inner time. You can look at it, what's happening in life today. It all starts with natural knowledge that separates us from spiritual truth. That's what happened in the garden of Adam and Eve. They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That is what we're seeing today is the fulfillment of this tree coming to life. Where it's more, it's all about more and more about knowledge. Just give me more and more natural knowledge at the absence of spiritual truth. Because the more you care about natural knowledge, the byproduct, the verdict of this is apathy. You just won't care about the spiritual truths anymore. You're not going to care about God Almighty anymore. That's the number one deception Satan's trying to do. The more we focus on just the relative natural things, the things we see with these eyes, the less we're going to care about the spiritual big picture. That's the deception. That's what Satan's goal is. So it's creating more and more apathy, not caring about God, not caring about the big picture, not caring about the, the eternal story of unfolding right before our very eyes. What is happening is just that it's all principles. It's very logical, very easy to understand when you understand the scriptures. More and more knowledge just puffs people up and creates more and more pride. By biblical definition, pride always leads to some form of destruction. First, relational. Because it's self-centered in nature, it's more focused on me, what I think is right versus wrong. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. What they began to create their own faith. What they thought was right or wrong versus what God said was right or wrong. They interpreted it and came to their own outcome. We're seeing the manifestation of this today. Is everybody has their own relative interpretation what they think is right and right. The fullness of darkness they loved. Love is what you really want to believe. What you believe is the best you'll fall in love with. And the more you love it, the more you'll want it and desire it and those desires will take control and it's going to bear some outcome. And the outcome is people begin to love darkness. 
So as they love more and more natural knowledge without God's supernatural knowledge, it leads to more pride, more shame, more guilt, more condemnation, more arrogance, more condemning of other people. It creates more and more division, more and more separation. And then this false sense of unity has to prevail, and that's exactly what happened before Jesus' day. This Greco-Roman government, here's how it works. So you can begin to see this unfolding. It's all prophesied. And you need to understand this. Ecclesiastes 3.15, which is the wisdom book. To interpret the scriptures properly, you have to understand, whatever is, has already been. So whatever is, present, has already been in the past. Whatever will be, future, has been before. The past is repeating. History does repeat itself. The Bible validates that. Why is that important? Because God is calling the past to account. He is calling us back to the garden to redeem that account. And He's doing it in a way that redeems perfect love on the earth. And that is voluntary. He's allowing us to decide what do we truly love the most. Spiritual truth or natural truth? Ourself or Him? And what's unfolding on the earth is dark, more and more darkness because people are so, when you're carnally minded, you're not thinking it's about time more than anything. You're not thinking about eternity. You're not thinking eternally. You're not thinking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years being on the earth. Your natural knowledge is all about thinking about the 70 to 100 years I have on the earth. And so I have to fulfill all these longing desires now. And that is not what Jesus taught. That is not what Jesus brought to life. He was saying no, people. Everything he taught was about the big picture. About the appointed time. About the appointed season. And about how he was coming back again. And how we would live here forever with him after his return. And that eternity truly begins on the day of the Lord and what he's ushering in forever for thousands and millions of years on the earth. But what Satan's main goal is this, is to Distraction by taking something good. Not This is why you're going to see in the Scriptures, the best way I can say it, is you've got to understand the heart of God. He has a love-hate relationship with the earth right now. He loves us unconditionally. And does He love just us or everyone? Everyone, because does He want anyone to perish? And does He want everyone to be saved? Yes. He loves everyone. He wants none to perish. But he hates how Satan is taking something that was not only good. In the Genesis 1 through 6, it was very good. He's using things that are good and very good to distract us, to, to get us under the wrong principles that can begin to self-destruct us. It's deception. The very things that are good, he's using that to destroy us spiritually. We perish little by little little because we're separating ourselves from true, selfless, unconditional, unmerited love. And it's all becoming selfish and self-consuming. And what that does in the soul realm is it takes your conscience and begins to close the door of your conscience and burns it and sears it and cuts it off. And then you live internally under in the soul realm, under the, the, the control of Satan, because now you live under this feeling of shame, guilt, condemnation, never feeling worthy enough. And so you feel empty and void on the inside so what it does is it produces more and more of an impulse because your heart no longer beats for something. It needs to be gratified by something in the natural realm to produce a feeling. And so the whole force that's being produced by the lack of understanding of time is this impulse of desire for more because we're trying to fulfill an eternity in 70 to 100 years. And Jesus came down screaming from the mountaintops, No! That's not right. He was trying to save us. He is God our Savior and trying to help us understand the fulfillment of how this is all playing out. So this is the unfolding of it. And what's happening is this. The ultimate, and this is what you need to understand as we're going into 10. 
the wheat and tares, you could also look at this, I know this looks as trees, but you can see this as if you picture in your mind, pictures of tares, which is a weed, and wheat, which is a good seed. They're intertwined until the end. What Jesus taught us is this. This is going to come to fruition, so is this. But what happens is the Antichrist comes first. The Antichrist is the full manifestation of this evil deception. Who he, His goal is to bring his wrath and his judgment on all believers and most importantly Jews in the Middle East. It's his control in trying to control the Jews in the Middle East, which are God's people, that is going to set off a global wave across the earth that will impact everyone. And God's response to his wrath wrath coming out is he is going to bring the wrath of a lamb to destroy the Antichrist to protect us his bride his church his children and so it's a protective measure but that's why God has a love-hate relationship with it but to understand this you have to understand to interpret scriptures is because the next chapters in Matthew 10, a lot of people teach, well, this happened in 70 A.D., and they leave it there. That is a truth. It did happen in 70 A.D. Jerusalem, the city, and the temple were destroyed in 70 A.D. But based on this, whatever will be has been before. So is this going to happen again? Yes, it's happened twice already. Uh, in the scriptures, you'll see the fullness is triune. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It happens threefold. Three strikes, you're out. God's not going to allow it to happen again. It's going to begin to unfold, but then the wrath of the Lamb is going to come for those who are trying to destroy Israel and destroy Jews and destroy Christians. God's wrath, and that's what you're seeing is this, is God's battle plan in the book of Revelation is He's revealing how He is going to come against evil and darkness and destroy evil and darkness and to save the light, to save His children. That's why the ultimate light, it says we are children of the light. It's called the kingdom of light. When God comes in, here's the fulfillment that you need to understand, is He saves His children after the wrath of the Antichrist comes in. It's a three and a half year period. He saves His children. He separates His children out of it. It's called the tribulation period that those who are on the earth shall go through. It's a three and a half year period. And he saves us before the worst of it. This is what's unfolding in the prophets in the book of Revelation. He comes and saves through the rapture after that three and a half years. And it unfolds. But then the final three and a half years is him destroying all evil remaining on the earth. And the final judgment is the, the final picture of this. is Just like in the day of Noah, he purged the earth with water. That's the old, oldest covenant. Covenant. The newest covenant is he's going to burn everything and start scratch. Using an agricultural paradigm, we live in the Midwest. Has anybody seen when somebody burns their ditch or burns pasture? That's what's taking place. The reason you do that is you, you burn out all the weeds or all the not good stuff that was consuming that area, but you know the seed in the ground will start back fresh and new. And so what God does in the wrath, that's why in the seven trumpets, the seals unfold, the trumpets and the bold judgments, you're seeing God purge the entire earth of all evil and all it is burned. And the old earth, everything is laid bare and it's a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. The new children of God, the kingdom of light prevails. That's why there's no longer a need for sun because the sun, Jesus, and Jerusalem is restored to the earth. And that is what now highlights the eternal heaven and earth together. And we live as children of that kingdom of light forever and ever and ever on earth with him, heaven and earth together again. So this is all unfolding the future. So Matthew 10 says this, be on your guard, you'll be handed over to local councils and will be flogged in the synagogues. Synagogues is another name for church buildings. 
On my account you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses them to the Gentiles. A Gentile is anybody who worships anything outside of God Almighty. They're worshiping some other little G God. Um, uh, my daughter had to learn this in her history class this past week. She had a test on it. The test on learning uh, the Buddhist Buddha, faith of Buddhism and Buddha and the faith of Hindus and the Hindu gods. They're little g-gods. That's taught in public schools even today. She had to learn the Greco-Roman gods. And ultimately what the scripture teaches, some people believe they're their own god. And so this is the unfolding, so be on your guard. So they're flogged in synagogue, their churches. On my account, you'll be brought before governors as witnesses to those folks of who is God Almighty, those who worship the Gentiles, other gods. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. So yes, this happened in 70 AD. Yes, Jesus talked to the disciples and the apostles because he showed up at the appointed time in this story and he understood it because he opened up Isaiah's prophet and knew exactly the appointed time where he was at in this story. And he unfolded it to him and the disciples and he knew he had to die and he knew it was coming. He actually told them that this is what was going to happen. You're going to be um, set up before these synagogue leaders, before, before these Pharisees and these Sadducees and before the Greco-Roman government, before this day happens, and it did in 70 AD. This happened in the Middle East, but it's going to happen again. It's unfolding as we see, and it's unfolding in our generation. After 70 AD, the Jews were exiled and scattered out all across the world. They no longer had a nation of Israel. They no longer had a city to worship in or a temple. But in our generation, I wasn't born, but the beginning of this happened in 1948. Israel became a nation. 1967, Jerusalem came back as their place to govern and to begin to worship again. And that is the main sign in this story when it says when a nation is born again. So when you see Israel get its nation back again, it's the beginning of the end of the end. It's the beginning of birth pains. What the birth pains are is, is before the new plan, the new life, the new heaven, the new earth, the new baby, the new Jerusalem, the new body, the, everything that's new that's supposed to come first, there's this tremor, this tribulation that's coming. And what that's saying is the pain of it is the Antichrist system unfolding on the earth that's going to produce the pain and the hurt on Christians and Jews first. And that pain we just have to endure through that process because God is bringing new light and new life and a new hope and a new glory a new baby coming forth and there's something we can rejoice in there's light at the end of the tunnel that's unfolding but even for us this will just so you know when you study it in scripture it happens most in the Middle East but the tremor sorry the tremor of the tribulation period the greatest uh, persecutions the greatest destructions the greatest wrath of the Antichrist and God unfolds in the Middle East it's all laid out in Scripture. But because of what has to happen before all this, it says there will become a one-world economy, just like in the Tower. Remember, history repeats itself. We're working backwards in time. The Revelation is you begin in Revelation, and you start reading back to Genesis. What we're seeing is the unfolding of that, like the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was where they could all begin to speak and communicate in one language and unfolded an economy all as one together. And they begin to create their own self-gods and their own pride and their own ability to self-govern across the entire world. And they begin to create their own false sense, peace and unity under this veiled guise of whatever is right for you is right for me. And there was a false sense of religion and peace that prevailed on the earth that as long as it's good for you, it's good for me. But that only works for a period of time because Satan wants every everybody to worship him and he's going to eventually the antichrist which is satan on the earth is going to rise up and he's going to say no and he's going to take try to take control but jesus is going to come back and say uh-uh that's not going to happen 
that. That's the unfolding the third time again. And at that time, if we're there, even in the United States, we're going to have ramifications of this because of the global economy and how we're intertwined. Because of the military, it says that Jesus will war against every nation. In the, in the prophets, it says that. So every nation is going to set off a World War III, and every nation is going to be part of this, and good and evil are going to be part of this whole thing, and it's going to just set out a global wave to this whole thing. We will experience it in part. The fullness is going to be in the Middle East, but we're going to be experiencing it if you're here in part. And that's why we need to watch and pray and prepare for this. But we don't need to live in fear because the power of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and understanding because we see it and know it and know how it unfolds and how to be safe and spared and overcome through the midst of it because God's goodness, He's revealed it through Jesus Christ already to us. But it does go on to say in 21, brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. This is happening in part. We're already seeing a lot of rebellion occur because people don't want to listen to their parents anymore. They don't want to listen to that because this level of knowledge is prevailing that this pride that begins to enter and this sense of self justice like I want what I want and, 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 and what I need is most important and I'm willing to do whatever I want and so you're seeing this rebellion happening in part but it says that it's going to just continue to get magnified more and more until the end to the point, and what you're going to see is where true colors really come out. When a hard trial like this is called a great and terrible day, because true colors really come out when people are really hard-pressed. You'll begin to see who truly loves you and who doesn't, who are true friends and who aren't. When hardship comes, when people are hard-pressed, what level of intimacy do you really have with those folks? But it goes on to say, you'll be hated by everyone because of me. That's Jesus. So this is Christians got to be prepared. We are going to become the ones that people hate. Because we believe in God Almighty. We don't submit and surrender to this believing and worshiping other gods. Because we understand those other gods are not really for them. They're against them and they're destroying them little by little. It says, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm till the what? end will be saved. This is why we know it's also future tense. The end. The end is the last day. The end is Jesus' return. The end is Him redeeming everything and saving the world and saving our bodies and bringing resurrection life to everything good. It says, now here's wisdom. When you are persecuted in one place, what does it tell us to do? Flee to another. Jesus showed that in wisdom. Jesus was persecuted, and so were the, the disciples and apostles at certain times, and they would just go to the next town. When it becomes this hard-pressed, one has to use wisdom that Jesus used if they want to continue to have an impact in the natural life today. Jesus even knew that. He knew if he stayed in certain places, his life would have ended prematurely versus fulfilling what his father asked him to do on the cross. That's why he would say to the disciples, I can't go there, or I need to go here, or here's where the Spirit's leading me. He would go from one place to the next. For him to fulfill his calling, he learned that there's a time to build up and a time to break down, as wisdom in Proverbs says. It says there's a time to plant and a time to uproot. In my natural family, we are naturally planted here. But if we need to uproot and move somewhere else, we will. This church will. I'm hoping and praying that this will be a place, because it says it will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. It will unfold like that. Those are That's an part of the judgment that's coming. It's fire judgments from heaven. That Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the last day, but the small town next to it was spared. I'm praying that Beaver Creek, Hills, Laverne, Steen, all of Rock County, this area where I'm naturally rooted is going to be a safe haven in the midst of this all unfolding that we can remain here. 
But that is yet to be foreseen because for that to happen, human beings have to choose to partner with Christ and to live in the principles of the kingdom of God for that to prevail. Light has to be established firmly in that area or else darkness will prevail like it did in Sodom and Gomorrah and the government and the people prevail there, therefore the judgments happen there. And it's important for us to understand how this unfolds. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That's why we know again this is prophetic in nature. It's His second coming because He had already come before this. The student is not above the teacher nor the servant above his master. This is important. There's teaching out there saying, hey, you know, and it, I love the heart behind it, is this, is because we're in this new covenant, because Jesus has saved us, because we have the Holy Spirit, we now have something greater than the past, which is a truth. But we're not greater than Jesus. The new covenant does not usher in something that was greater than our master Jesus. We are not immune to persecution. Jesus and the disciples weren't either. We are immune from everything that's from Satan in regards to sickness, death, disease, poverty, all these things that came through sin. But we're not immune to the persecution of other people. We do have the ability to overcome it through wisdom and discernment, through, pop, through, through, um, through partnering with the Holy Spirit and going where the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. We also have the ability to overcome if we partner, and the prophet Isaiah says that the prayers of the saints release the judgments of God. That's what's happening, unfolding the book of Revelation. That if we are a praying church as this unfolds and we're partnering with the Holy Spirit with Jesus saying, Lord, release trumpet number one. Lord, release trumpet number two. Lord, release trumpet number three, which are the judgments. And we're in a place of prayer. And what's happening is you're seeing militarily it's unfolding and we're working together with him to win the battle. So the praying church will prevail in the day because the judgments won't be unfolded. That's why Jesus said, my house will become a house of prayer for all nations. So it's through prayer that we're actually partnering with God in the end times because it's already written the military battle plan that we're releasing the trumpets and the bold judgments on the earth so they're not coming at us, they're coming against evil for us. But because we have free will, we could be like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's an example. Lot, here's God's mercy in it. God went down knowing that this was going to happen. He saw Lot was a righteous man living in this city that was so perverted with darkness and death and destruction and lust and all these worldly things that he sent angels in and said, you need to get out before this happens. That's what's going to be happening. I'm going to be verbally blowing the trumpet as this stuff unfolds because I can see it through scriptures. And I'm going to be telling people, hey! You need to be ready because it's all happening. Here's what's seeing. And others, I hope, will also be helping to do this. But people have free will and choose what they want. Lot's family had the ability to escape, but his wife didn't want to fully leave. And she turned back and she became subject to that judgment and she didn't have to be. That's why the next stuff, you have to understand this. It goes on to say it is not enough for students that if the head of the house is called Beelzebub, which is Satan, they called Jesus Satan. They said, oh, Jesus, you're, so re you're, you're not cool, you're not fun, you're not good, you're not, you're just like the devil because you're trying to take all our fun. And he's saying, no. I'm trying to heal. I'm trying to restore. I'm trying to give you joy. I'm trying to give you life. But because he wasn't so radical and so worldly and so just focused on the here and the now, people thought he was like the devil. And that's the same way those who try to live it this way with a pure heart are going to be judged. How much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them for there is... Now catch this point, church. There is what? Nothing, no thing concealed that will not be disclosed. What that's mean is nothing is hidden can stay there. In your heart, in your head, God already sees it. He knows inside our head and heart. He's spirit. He sees spirit to spirit. So there's no sense to fake it to make it. Just be real and be honest. 
But God also sees what's happening, the evil inside of heads and hearts. And nothing that's hidden is going to remain hidden. That day, the light of Jesus' return is going to expose all darkness. Nothing hidden is going to remain. It will all will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. It is all going to be revealed when Jesus returns because when the heavens split open and every eye sees that God is real, nothing is going to be hidden anymore. What I tell you in the dark, this is for us. Speak in the daylight because everything He told the disciples and us in the darkness is all about goodness and light and life and eternity and truth. He's saying tell people the big picture. Help them to understand the real what's happening, what's unfolding, what is whispered in the ear. Proclaim it from the roofs. That's what I'm trying to do to people. I'm trying to get people, just so you know, in the heart of humanity, everybody wants a great awakening. It's not going to happen like that. It is, but it isn't. The Bible commands us to stay awake, not to reawaken. It says, do not fall asleep. It's the, to stay awake means you see the light in your heart and you have understanding of eternal truth. And the big picture It's saying, to remain awake is to have an understanding of the big picture and what's happening in time. That's how we remain awake. It says, do not fall asleep like the rest of them. Do not get darkened into your understanding like the rest of them, or else you'll reap the same hard that they're going to face. But it says, speak this. It says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. So we're not to be afraid of this because God is going to resurrect. He's going to, there is eternal life. We don't need to fear death. You are, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens to you this day, when He comes, you're going to get your body back. It's going to be renewed and glorious and beautiful, and you're going to live forever and ever on earth and have all eternity to enjoy heaven and earth together again. That's the absolute truth. He says, don't be afraid of those who are just carnally minded, that think if they kill you, then they've won. Because they haven't. But he said, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the final destruction. That's, that's the absolute truth. Is Jesus Christ is the final judge. There is only one judge. And he has the ability to destroy not just body, but body and soul in hell eternally. That's the final judgment day where he and all has prevailed between light and darkness and everything's been exposed and he's going to destroy all evil so that all good can live forever and ever. Here's the value you and I have to him. It says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of the Father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Praise Jesus, David, right? Praise Jesus, Troy, right? <laughs> Easy Satan destroyed my hair. This came out when I started a business. And I got under a lot of stress and death and destruction. And my hair started to fall out. But God knows how it works. Because I know how science works. And they have to have living organisms in here to make it all work. And God is going to... Re you know the good news, brothers? It says in Proverbs, for everything that Satan stole, we get sevenfold back. Woo! I'm going to have a sweet head of hair coming. It's going to look like her back there. My beautiful daughter that has a beautiful head of hair. But God values us, church. Whatever you've lost, mine is hair. Yours might be something else. It might have been some other form of health or relationship. Some of you have gone through other health problems. God's going to redeem that. Mine's just my hair. Yours is something else. God is going to restore and redeem that and make it even better. That's the hope of what's coming. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever does what? Disowns. That's the key important. Whoever sins or whoever disowns. Big difference. It's not about sin anymore. It's whether you own your faith. You, what I can't do for you is you have to own this understanding. You have to possess it in your heart. Believe it with all your heart and profess it with your mouth. Because it says, whoever professes me, believes, owns their faith, and professes is this. But whoever disowned me does not believe it, or who doesn't profess it, 
says, I will disown my father. That's the final judgment. The final judgment is when this, at the end of the harvest, it says all souls, every eye is going to see Jesus coming back. Whether you're seeing it from heaven, earth, or Hades. Hades is a holding tank for disembodied spirit beings. Say this again. I am a spirit. I, am spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Your body does not identify you. Your spirit. You are a spirit being. And so for those who have not understood it, who are in Hades, everything in the final judgment comes back. And God separates the sh it says the sheep from the, the, uh, the goats is another analogy he uses. Believers from non-believers. And those who own him, their inheritance is heaven and earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. You inherit. We inherit. We get the promise back for all eternity. And for those who disowned him, who rejected and rebelled, they have eternal damnation and all evil will be destroyed, burned off of the earth so that we get to enjoy everything good forever and ever. Is that good news? So we don't need to get angry. We don't need to get discouraged. We don't need to get dis disappointed if we can truly own this light and this truth in our heart. So do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on the earth. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus came, did he, does it look like he did this? This is where it takes discernment. It says, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. When Jesus came, did he bring a sword right away? No, he brought peace first. That's why even Peter, Peter thought that, oh, the battle's on. Jesus is going to redeem Jerusalem right now. He is going to bring this final judgment right now. So Peter drew his sword and he cut off a man's ear and he looked to him and said, Peter, what are you doing? You are in the wrong spirit because he did not discern the time in here. We have to submit to this sovereign plan of timing and we can't do what Jesus did not do first. Jesus died to himself and communicated peace and love and compassion and mercy to people first before the law is laid down in judgment. And that is what he did first. But the outcome of that is going to bring a sword. It's going to bring division. I pray that my daughters don't divide from me over this. I pray that you don't divide from me. But the reality is this. The outcome is this. Either somebody's going to love the world and all that they're pursuing right now in their heart, they're going to love one and hate the other, it says. That's why Jesus has a love-hate relationship with it. I love all the goodness that God has created, but I hate how Satan is using it to pull people and separate the relationships and to separate and divide families and to ultimately slowly destroy people from true peace, joy, and health. And that's the Father's heart in it. But in the end, he is going to win through a sword and he's going to destroy evil through it. It does say, for I've come to turn a man against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of their own households. Because if you love the world, the opposite, here's how it works. I just want you all to understand it. It's all about love. It starts with apathy. But the, more, the less you care about something, it just slowly pulls away. And the more you love one thing, you're eventually, what's the opposite? You're eventually going to hate the other. And you're, it's all about guarding and shepherding the heart. So to br start bringing it to the final conclusion, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That word worthy, I was meditating on it, and here's what the Lord revealed to me. It, worth, value, equals likeness. The word in the Greek is likeness. It's what it's like. The best example of this is in the natural realm, you can have a true, pure diamond. And the fake one that looks like it's called a cubic zirconia. Now the value and the worth of that is completely different. To the naked eye, if you don't look up close, you don't see the quality of the truth of it. But unless you know the truth of the purity of it, you really understand the value and worth of it. So it's all about likeness. What Jesus is saying here is this. 
Anyone who loves their mother or father more than me is not like me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not like me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not like me. Because what he's showing is how he prevailed in true selfless love. He loved his Abba Daddy Father in the sovereign plan of redemptive love more than he loved presently the natural realm because he, why? Hopefully you can get this point. He had to live out the big picture first because he loved us so much. Because if he didn't submit to this big picture first, he couldn't have saved and redeemed and restored us and his family in the end. Does that make sense? So that's the love-hate relationship he has with this. He hated, that's the Garden of Gethsemane, where he wept blood because he, he understood how it all works. And it, it mourned and grieved his heart on how Satan is doing this so deceptively and deceiving people that it hurt him so badly that he, he, he poured out blood and sweat and tears. And it grieved him because he didn't want to leave us, his children. He didn't want us, it grieves him to see us go through hard times. It grieves me when I see my daughter or daughters go through times that they don't have to experience because I see and understand more the bigger picture. But he has to let us go through this so that we can gain understanding of the fullness of love in the end. So that love always prevails and always wins. He has to let it unfold so that we truly trust his goodness, that he's not a killjoy, but a giver of true joy that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. That is what he's saying by that. That's why he says whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake truly finds it. Is when this is where I want to end with this to help you understand it. Out there we have a sign that says, Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It starts with faith and understanding how life works. The difference between the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, how God came one way and came now another way in grace and mercy, how He's waiting very patiently for us all in His grace and mercy to come to an understanding of what true love is. It's selfless and it's humble and it stays unified. And He's operating right now by pure grace and mercy on the earth, not counting people's sins against it because His wrath came down through on the cross on His Son, Jesus Christ, so that He could redeem true love and understand for us now and we can live in his grace and his mercy now but he's waiting patiently for us to get it to understand it to be prepared because he has to come back one more time to lay down the law just like he did on Jesus he's going to lay it down this time on Satan and he's going to destroy evil forever but what he's saying is this, hope is where you become established. You can have faith and understanding of this, but if your hope is still in trying to achieve the ideal now, here's what's going to happen to you emotionally. Because whenever you put your hope in something natural, it's all relative to the condition. So it's going to be constantly going up and down and all around. So you're going to struggle to find joy. You're going to struggle to continue to find peace. But when your hope and your vision is on when Jesus returns and how he destroys evil and how I get to spend all this time with my friends and my family and I don't need to be afraid of evil anymore and I can explore the whole earth and enjoy everything that God created and is good and and have thousands and thousands and millions of years to do this with the goodness of everything and the great plan of this eternal redemptive plan and that playing out when that becomes your hope and the vision of your life no matter what tunnel in there's always light at the end of it when your hope is established in the return of the Lord Jesus and what he's bringing forth after that point your hope that's why it says hope deferred makes the heart sick when your hope is secure in that, your heart cannot get sick anymore. Your heart will be established on something that's concrete. 
and it's strong and so then you can truly love because now you know that love wins it never fails I see how God is going to win and I see how all the desires in my heart that are good to explore the earth and to spend it with time and family and friends and all the cool things that God has created I get to enjoy that forever and ever and I don't have to try to do it in 70 years and destroy myself in the process and destroy all the relationships in the process Process. When your hope is in that, it's secure. Now you can let go like Jesus did in the garden. He let go of that. It said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He could lay down his life because now he went from mourning to joy because no matter what happens now, there's something better coming. And it's going to last forever and ever. I want to go to the extreme logical of this. I had a pastor and a mentor who said it this way. He said, my buddies, who he's a big burly friend, all my big buddy friends who are non-believers, they said, what if this isn't true? What if you're just not right? And he said, he goes, I said to him this way, even if I am wrong and you guys don't believe in any of this, my life is still better. I wake up every day with hope, no matter how bad it gets. And I can find a place to get peace and joy and love where you don't have that. So he said, logically speaking, even if I live this way and this whole story is not right, I still have a better life than you. He said, but I know it's true. Because the way this is fulfilled, it is mathematically impossible of how Jesus and God orchestrated this over thousands of years. He's like, I know absolutely for certain this is true. But even if it weren't, it's still... He said, you'd be foolish not to believe this. You would be an absolute fool not to place your hope in this because you're going to live a worse life without it. The only thing that would hold you back from this is your own self-centeredness and pride, which will destroy you in the end because it's not true love. Anyone who welcomes me or welcomes this message, which is the prophetic, and anyone who welcomes the one who sent him will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. So it's a reward of peace, joy, and hope. The kingdom of God inside of us is about peace, joy, and righteousness in Christ Jesus. It's a, it's a spiritual reward we have now. But prophecy is about telling the future and what's unfolding. There's another reward that's coming. We all have the same inheritance. You and I are living out an apprenticeship right now. How we live out our life echoes in eternity. Anybody know what movie that is? Gladiator. <laughs> One of my favorites. It's an apprenticeship for what's coming. The inheritance is all the same, but the rewards are different. The rewards of just living out this life can be different. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of the little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will not lose a reward. God values the little things. God values when you lay down your life in compassion and love for other people, giving your life like Jesus did to other people, it will be rewarded when he returns. I end with this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He is going to redeem heaven and earth for all eternity. As some understand slowness because they're not thinking about the big picture. Instead, he's patient with whom? You. Who's you? Raise your hand if you're you. He's patient with us. Why? Because does he want any of us to perish? No. But he wants everyone to come to repentance. Repentance means change your heart. Stop thinking just carnally about 70 years because that's not the absolute truth. You have to begin to repent. Change your heart to thinking about the big picture eternally. And that is what will give you life and give it to the full. It's a promise.